necropsy lab, our most recent case is a very peculiar one involving three dead individuals. The first body belongs to a female chicken by the name of Susie McBeaker. Our second body belongs to a male chicken by the name of Harry Roos. In order to determine the cause of death of each chicken, we must first perform a set of necropsies. We've broken down our necropsies into separate organ systems to analyze. In our autopsy, we focused on a few key features of external anatomy to help us determine the cause of death of Susie, Sally, and Harry. The ear is the organ of hearing and balance. The earlobe is right below the ear. It's color often correlates with the color of the egg the chicken lays. So for Sally and for Susie, they laid white eggs. I'd be concerned if Harry laid an egg. Um, it's also a modification of the skin. The feather is composed of keratin and it's used to protect and insulate the bird. Brachial vein is a large vein under the wing and it's used for blood collection. Comb and waddle is mainly ornamental. The size and color is sex hormone dependent. The oral cavity is the place where the food is taken into the mouth. It's also the place where you see the opening to the esophagus and the tongue. Finally, we have the uropygeal gland, also called the preen gland. The preen gland is a bilobed sebaceous gland. It's at the base of the tail. It is used to waterproof feathers, and basically what the chicken does is that when the chicken is preening, the chicken will take some of the sebum and will put it on the feathers to help waterproof the feathers and waterproof the bird. These are the muscles of the wing. The first muscle is the end biceps brachii. Its origin is the glenoid fossa and humerus. Its insertion is the proximal anterior surface of the radius. Its function is to flex the wing. The next muscle in the wing that we're going to talk about is the end triceps brachii. The origin is the scapula and proximal humerus. The insertion is the olecranon process, and its function is to flex the shoulder and extend the arm. Here we have the muscles of the thigh and leg. The first muscle is the iliotibialis. Its origin is in the pelvis, and its insertion is the proximal tibia and the patellar ligament. Its function is to flex the hip and extend the knee, as well as extend the lower leg. Another muscle in the leg is the sartorius. The origin is the lumbosacral area. Its insertion is the patellar ligament, and its function is to flex the hip and extend the knee. Next, we have the semitendinosus. Its origin is in the ilium and ischium. Its insertion is the caudal femur, and its function is to extend the thigh. We also have the semimembranosus. Its origin is the lateral surface of the ischium. Its insertion is the caudal surface of the tibiotarsus, and its function is to extend the thigh and flex the knee. We also have the quadriceps femoris. Its origin is in the ilium. Its insertion is the patellar ligament, and its function is to extend the thigh. We also have the ambience muscle. Its origin is the ilium and pubis. Its insertion is the proximal tibiotarsus, and its function is adduction.
Next, we have the adductor longus. Its origin is the ilium and pubis. Its insertion is the distal femur. And its function is adduction, and it also extends the thigh. We also have the gastrocnemius. Its origin is the distal femur and the proximal tibiotarsus. Its insertion is the tuber calcanei, and its function is to flex the knee and extend the foot. The last muscle of the thigh and leg we'll talk about is the tibialis anterior. The origin is the tibia. Its insertion is the medial cuneiform and first metatarsals. And its function is to flex the tarsometatarsus forward. Finally, we have the muscles of the chicken breast. The superficial pectoral muscle originates at the sternum, furcula, and sternal ribs. It inserts at, on the ventral surface of the humerus, and its main function is the downward movement of the wing. So it pulls the wing down. We also have the supracoracoides. Its origin is also the sternum, furcula, and sternal ribs. Its insertion, however, is at the proximal dorsal surface of the humerus. Its function is the elevation of the wing. So the superficial pectoral muscle brings the wing down, and the supracoracoideus brings the wing up. The digestive systems of Harry, Sally, and Susie are identical and not different based on their genders. The time from when the food enters the mouth and exits the cloaca ranges from 2 to 24 hours. At the beginning of the tract is the mouth, which in a chicken contains no lips nor teeth. The sharp part of the mouth that protrudes outwards is the beak, which is used to crush, tear, and hold food. Inside the mouth is the tongue. The tongue is triangular, narrow, has few taste buds and muscles, but many touch receptors. These receptors help the chicken distinguish food by feel. Continuing down the tract is the esophagus. This organ is a muscular tube that runs perpendicular and mostly dorsal to the trachea. And following the trachea is the crop, which is a large sac that contains temporary storage for food. Further down the esophagus is a proventriculus. This is the part of the digestive tract most similar to the human stomach. It is glandular and secretes hydrochloric acid, peptic enzymes, and mucus for digestion. After the proventriculus is a gizzard. This organ has a very thick muscular wall with a sandpaper-like inner surface. The gizzard mashes, grinds, and mixes food, especially hard materials, with strong contractions of muscles and the presence of grits. Next, the small intestines are divided into the jejunum, ilium, and the duodenum. The jejunum and ilium are posterior to the duodenum. Connecting the tube to the small intestine is the mesentery. The mesentery fixes the small intestines to the dorsal abdominal wall and supports the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries and veins within the tissue. Absorption of nutrients is the primary function of the small intestine. The large intestine follows the small intestine. The large intestine is where the last of water reabsorption occurs. Finally, the cloaca is where the fecal material from the intestines is collected and ejected from the body through the vent. Apart from these organs, the pancreas is located within the duodenal loop of the small intestines. The ducts are normally hidden by the tissue. The bile ducts enter the duodenum near the pancreas. The intestinal cecum contains a bacterial population important to the digestion of plant cellulose. This is also the place where water reabsorption takes place. The liver is a large four-lobed gland in the abdomen. The coronary ligament attaches the liver to the pericardium and the falciform ligament fixes the ventral surface of the liver to the ventral body wall. Finally, the gallbladder stores bile that is produced in the liver. The gallbladder intermittently discharges bile into the duodenum to aid digestion and absorption of lipids.
In Sally and Susie, we found the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system consists of the ovary, the infundibulum, the magnum, the isthmus, the uterus, the vagina, and the cloaca. The first part of the system is the ovary. Most female animals have two functioning ovaries, but a chicken has only one. The right ovary stops developing once the female chicken hatches, while the left continues to mature. On the ovary of a laying age hen, you will find yolky yellow follicles. Follicles are arranged in a hierarchy of size, with the largest one, F1, being next to the ovulate. F2 is next in line, followed by F3, and so on. We also have the immature follicles, which are small and will develop over time. Post-ovulatory follicles are follicular structures left behind following the ovulation of the oocyte. Next, we have the infundibulum, which is the portion of the oviduct that receives the oocyte after ovulation and directs it towards the magnum. This is also one of the sites for sperm storage in the chicken. The oocyte enters the magnum next. The magnum is thick-walled with glands that produce and secrete albumin and other proteins that contribute to the egg. On average, the oocyte will stay here for about two hours. The next step is the isthmus, which is thinner walled compared to the magnum. This is where the egg membrane is formed, and the oocyte remains here for one to two hours before moving on to the uterus. The uterus is also called the shell gland and is the site of shell formation and pigmentation. This process takes approximately 20 hours. Continuing down the system, we have the vagina, which is the segment of the oviduct between the shell gland and the cloaca. Sperm are stored in tubal glands at a junction between the vagina and the shell gland. Finally, the fully formed egg exits the female reproductive system through the cloaca. In comparison, the male reproductive system found in Harry is relatively simpler. Unlike in mammals, the entire system is located inside the bird. The male chicken has two light yellow elliptical shaped testes along their back, near the anterior ends of the kidneys. These connect two vast deferens which each open into a small bump on the dorsal wall of the cloaca, and these small bumps act as the copulatory organ of the chicken. So, this is the respiratory system, and it consists of the trachea, the lungs, the air sac, the glottis, and the serum. So, the trachea is our windpipe, it's right here, and it's the pathway for air to enter and exit the body, and it also moistens and warms the air as it's flowing into the lungs. And the trachea is surrounded by cartilaginous rings for support. Now, as you go down, it splits off into two bronchi. And the bifurcation, which is where it splits off, is also the location of the syrinx, which is a cartilaginous structure that helps birds produce their sound. And we also have the air sacs, which are thin walled extensions of the lungs. And they're balloon like, so they expand and contract, and that allows air to move in and out. Now we also have the glottis which is an opening to the trachea. So this is the circulatory system of the chicken. A chicken's heart will beat anywhere from 200 to 300 times per minute. And it, in general, it works the same as many other four-chambered circulatory systems. The blood enters from the body through the superior and inferior vena cava. It goes into the right atrium, which then pushes the blood into the right ventricle. From there, the blood goes through the pulmonary artery, which isn't shown here because if it was 3D, it would be on the outside. And it goes to the lungs to get oxygenated. Then it comes back through the pulmonary vein into the left atrium. From there, it goes to the left ventricle and then out through the aorta. The entire circulatory system, well, the heart, is surrounded by the pericardial sac, which has a visceral layer, which is on the inside closest to the heart, and a parietal layer, layer which is on the outside and is further away. The pericardial sac is filled with pericardial fluid, which helps protect the heart. This is the general layout of the circulatory system as it goes through the body. It starts off oxygenated in arteries, an example being the aorta, and the arteries split into arterioles which then get smaller and smaller until you get to the capillaries, which is where the actual gas exchange occurs. Then the deoxygenated blood enters the venules, which get bigger and bigger until you get veins, which then go back to the heart. This is the urogenital system of the chicken. It consists of two main parts, 
the ureter, and the kidneys. The kidneys are three lobe structures in which they are found in the body cavities formed by the ilium and the syncacrum. And coming off of the middle, the most cranial lobes of the kidneys are the ureters. They are tubules running parallel to the abdominal aorta and end in the cloaca. After conducting necropsies on all three bodies, we have determined that Sally Short and Harry Roos died by poisoning, while Susie McBeaker died of extreme blunt force trauma and internal bleeding. Detectives have also just informed us that Susie and Harry were engaged, but it turns out that Harry was having an affair with Sally Shore. After several witness reports of the two females arguing, we have reasonable evidence to conclude that vengeance thirsty Susie poisoned both her cheating fiancé and his mistress before fleeing from the scene upon which she was hit by a tea cat. Case closed!